If you would, please take your copy of God's Word and turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. I know you just got nice and comfortable, but let's go ahead and stand, give God our undivided attention and respect, and then if you'll have your bulletin handy after we read this passage, we will quote the 1 Peter 2, 1, 24 and 25. Second Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. You may be seated. Well, if you weren't already praying for me, and I hope you were, uh, you, you probably are now having just read that. Wow, what a, what a treasure chest we have to unpack. And I'm praying for you as well. I said a few weeks back in our study through the first four verses in this book that a growing Christian is a knowing Christian. Christian. A growing Christian is a knowing Christian. And today we see that on full display, but same concept, but it's slightly a reverse order. A knowing Christian is a growing Christian. There's a holy discontentment in the life of every born again heart. I say a holy discontentment. Oh, we are satisfied in Christ, yes. But there's a longing for more. We're not uh, stagnant. We're not stale. We're not just content to be where we are. We want to surge forward in our knowledge of Christ and in his Christ-like character being developed in us. First thing I want you to see is verse 5, we must spend a little time in this first phrase, now for this very reason. That should take you back, and if you've been trucking along with us, you, you're thinking back already. But in verses 1 through 4, the Holy Spirit through Peter has marvelously laid the groundwork of what God has done for you in Christ and who you are in Christ. That is so crucial that you linger there for a moment because if you don't, then what you're going to do is you're going to turn verses 5 through 11 into a checklist of I have to do these, these seven things or else... I'm not a Christian, or else he doesn't love me, or else I'm not accepted. The fancy way of putting it is the indicatives of the Bible always precede the imperatives. The indicatives precede and enable the imperatives. So, so just quickly look at some of these indicatives. And by the way, that's just a, a figure of speech stating what is. It indicates a reality that has been established. It's not telling you to do something. It's telling you what has been done on your behalf. 
So look with me in verse 1. To those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called you, who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. I cannot re-preach the last three sermons, but if you haven't heard them, go back online and listen to those, because wonderful indicatives in those four verses, showing us who Christ is, what he has done on our behalf, whose we are in him. That's so important. And now he says, for this very reason, meaning those first four verses, he says, in light of that, now go out and live this way. Build upon your most holy faith that's in Christ. You're already saved you're already known by Christ. You already know Christ. You've already experienced Christ's divine power in salvation. Now go and live that out. Build upon it. Not the other way around. Uh, we obey because we're saved, not the other way around. We love him because he first loved us, not the other way around. To live the other way around is, in fact, to live out another gospel, Paul would say in Galatians, and he, then he follows it up by saying, which is really no gospel at all. Verse 5, if, if, you've, if you're familiar with this passage, you might think I missed one. You might have counted eight things, and I said seven things. But I do believe there are seven things, and they're all springboarded off of faith in Christ. That's the anchor. And then the seven things follow. Again, he's reiterating, you already have faith in Christ. Now go and build upon that faith. Look at verse 5, the way he words it. It says, now, for this very reason, also applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and so on and so forth. We'll get to that list. Um, faith in Christ is assumed. It is foundational for the rest of living that out. Let me give you a horizontal uh, Im image or illustration there's a world of difference between these two marriages. One is the husband, he doubts the love of his wife and he labors to earn her love. So get that picture in your mind. A husband, he doubts his wife's love. He works tirelessly to earn it. The second one is the husband rests assured of his wife's love for him, and he gladly strives to live worthily of it. It's not a job. It's a joy. And that is crucial that we get that right off the bat. Now, let's look at, let's continue. He says, Applying all diligence. I think the ESV says something a little different. Make every effort to supply. Either way you look at it, there's some strong language here. He's not saying because you're sure of your salvation, you can coast. He's not saying that at all. He's saying because you're, you're sure of your salvation, surge forward. Make every effort. Apply all diligence to supply. 
The Greek word here for supply, it's also used in verse 11, is an interesting word. It referred to a wealthy man who would give everything necessary to put on a play or a performance. Uh, it meant to give lavishly because these wealthy donors did not want to be looked at as, as cheapskates. So they put on the Ritz so that everyone in the community could see, oh, Dr. Smith supplied all of the choreography and all of the, the trimmings for today's performance. So Peter is using that word to say something like this. Since you have such a great Savior, since you're enjoying such a great salvation, make every effort eagerly, lavishly to supply these seven qualities on the foundation of your faith in Christ. Here's, here's how I put it in modern colloquialism. Don't build a tin shack on a foundation of gold. Christ and your faith in Christ is the foundation of gold. Now, live like that is really precious to you and to God. And to drive that point home even more, Peter gives us five incentives that's looking at it positively. Five incentives, or if you want to look at it negatively, five warnings if you're not surging forward from a foundation of faith in Christ. I want you to just follow along with me in your Bible. I've got the New American Standard. Some of you have different versions, but I want you to be able to put your finger on these five incentives warnings. Verse 8, for if these qualities, what qualities? We're going to get to them. There are the seven right above it. For if these qualities are yours and increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's number one. And you could flip that, grammatically you wouldn't be abusing the text, you could flip that and say this, if you're not growing in these, these uh, virtues, these fruits, these um, characteristics of Christ, then you are rendered useless and unfruitful in the true knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let that just sink in for a minute. I think if I ask us today to raise our hands, if we wanted to have a life useful and fruitful for the Lord Jesus Christ, I think everybody here would raise their hand. I mean, who wants to just say, no, I want to waste my life. I don't want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, when I meet the Lord. I just want to live and get as close to the world or as close to sin as I can and just get to heaven by the skin of my teeth. That, that's me. I don't think anybody would say that. And he's saying, if you want your life to count, then grow in your knowledge of Christ and grow in these seven virtues of Christ's likeness. And you will be useful. You will be fruitful. You will be. It's a promise. I heard a story of a pastor who was jogging. John, you might appreciate this. Sometimes I call John and I can tell he's out jogging because he's got his earbuds in and he's talking to me as he's jogging. And he said, this pastor said, Lord, make my life and ministry like, or bless it like you did Spurgeon. And he said, all of a sudden, he heard this word in his heart, really. 
which Spurgeon, John or Charles? And so he knew that John Spurgeon was the unknown pastor who was the father of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And John did not have a fruitful ministry the way Charles did in that he was recognized 200 years later or so, 150 years later we're talking about. You probably didn't even know about John Spurgeon. But he was a godly dad, a godly pastor. He raised Charles Spurgeon under the gospel and God saved him and we know the rest. But I thought that was interesting. We want a fruitful life. We want a useful ministry to the Lord. And God says, I promise you, you will have that, but it may not be the way you would want that. But you just can't help but bless others when you're godly and you're walking in Christ's likeness. It's going to splash over the side of the cup and bless other people. It's going to happen. But conversely, if you're not walking with Christ and not growing in godliness, there's nothing much in the cup to slosh over onto others. Well, I won't go into all the other ones that in depth. We'd be here all day. But that's the first one. The second one is this. He says, for he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. This, this intrigued me. I still don't know that I found the seams of the coconut on this verse. Is this a cause or an effect? Is he saying, if you're not growing in these seven things, you become blind? You become forgetful? Or is he saying, because you've been forgetful of all that God did for you in Christ... That's why you're not surging forward. I, I think it can be both, honestly. Is he talking about someone who's really not a Christian? They're just a fake Christian. They, they, they made the profession. They, they went through the ritual of baptism, but they, they're blind. They don't even look back to that forgiveness of sins anymore. They're just so worldly. Or is it a Christian who has gotten off track and needs this jarring reminder. Again, I don't know for sure. I love what Aiken said in his commentary. He said, We don't have to know which of these two conditions Peter had in mind. Was it a Christian who had just gotten off track or is this a, a pretend Christian who's not saved at all? He says, we don't have to know which of these two conditions Peter had in mind. In fact, it's safe to say that Peter didn't know. All he knew was that there were some professing Christians who were ineffective and unfruitful when it came to the godly traits listed in verses 5 through 7. It's still that way today. Our faith in Christ was never intended to be limited to our initial conversion. Faith was and is intended to mature. Many people have professed faith in Christ for decades, but their faith looks exactly the way it did when they first confessed it. So the jury is still out on whether their calling, verse 10, and election, verse 10, is legitimate. That's why Peter goes on to compel his readers then and today to remove any shadow of doubt. Quickly, he, he says in verse 10, again, this is the third incentive or warning. He says, verse 10, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and his choosing or electing you. Number four is, for as long as you practice these things, what things? The seven things we'll look at in a moment. Uh, you will never fall, never stumble. Now, that doesn't mean we know. He's not saying, if you live this way, you'll be sinless. We understand what he means by you will not stumble, you will not fall, because of the very next phrase, 
For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. In other words, you will not miss heaven. You will enter into heaven triumphantly. I love what Stephen Cole says about this word, this phrase, abundantly supplied to you. He says, the abundant entrance into the eternal kingdom may have behind it the picture of a returning soldier who is welcomed into the city with great fanfare. In the same way, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will welcome those who have been diligent to fight the good fight. He will welcome them into the eternal city. All right, you, you might have questions. I, I, I went through that pretty quickly. Let's get to the list here. And I'm not going to have time to pull every morsel of meat off the bone. You're going to have some homework to do when you get home this week. But then I'm going to end by circling back and tackling a couple of questions that you might have through this passage. One thing, why did Peter choose these qualities? I mean, similarly, Paul says in Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And Peter goes a slightly different route here. Why these qualities? I don't know 100%, but my hunch is when we get to chapter 2, I believe he chose them because they are the exact opposite traits of what we see from these false teachers in chapter 2. They did not have moral excellence. They did not have Christ-likeness. They claimed to have knowledge, but they didn't know God. They lacked self-control and indulged in the flesh. Chapter 2, verses 2, 10, 14, and 18, we'll get to that. They were not persevering in godliness. They had gone astray. And rather than demonstrating true brotherly kindness and agape love, which means you love people the way God loves them, they were simply using the Christians in this community, they were exploiting them for their own financial gain and they were exploiting them for a numbers game look at how many follow me look at how large my gathering is so perhaps that's why peter used these seven things because when he's getting to chapter two he's saying oh not so with the ungodly not so with the false teachers this list begins with faith and I've said that's the foundation of all the other seven. And it ends with love. And that agrees with the rest of the New Testament teaching that faith working through love is the evidence of genuine salvation. Let me say that again. Faith working through love is the evidence of genuine salvation. So, again, let me belabor the point one more time. I see faith in Christ as the foundation that these other seven virtues are built upon. If you're diagramming it, you would go back to faith in Christ seven times and, and let that be the springboard. Standing firm in your faith in Christ, now apply yourself diligently to advance in moral excellence. As you stand firm in your faith in Christ, do not be satisfied, but press on to increase your knowledge, etc., etc. Michael Green, commentator, gives these brief words about these seven virtues. Moral excellence was used to denote the proper fulfillment of something. We might say it like this. It is the excellence of a knife 
to cut well. It is the excellence of a horse to run fast. Green points out Peter uses it just two verses earlier to refer to Jesus. So he's saying here, it means follower of Christ, grow in looking more like Christ. Number two, knowledge. This word tells us how to think, how to use our tongue, how to behave in just about every imaginable situation. Yes, it has to do with knowing Christ, but it has to do with applying that knowledge. Green says, as we put this knowledge into use, it helps us grow to know Jesus better and reflect him more. Number three. Self-control. God works it in us as we walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So God works it in us as we walk in the Spirit. But we must also work to practice this. Remember, he's saying, make every effort, apply all diligence an athlete, for example, must say no to junk food in order to keep in shape for game day. An athlete must work out when he doesn't feel like working out for game day. This word applies to controlling all desires, including greed, sex, food, emotions, and the use of our time. Let me come up for air for just a minute. And you see this tension. So, so which is it? Are we to say, oh, the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. So we're just to sort of sit back and go, Holy Spirit, produce that fruit in my life today. Or is it that we are to strain and sweat and work out strategies to be more self-controlled? And the answer is yes. And there is, there is a cause and effect, right? So we never want to drift into moralism or performance Christianity where we pull ourselves up by the bootstraps apart from the grace of God, apart from his working by the Spirit in us. But be careful not to wreck in either of those ditches. Next, number four, and add to your self-control perseverance. Green says this word perseverance means that we keep following Christ even when it results in persecution or hardship. We heard that this morning in our Sunday school out of John 12. Number five, godliness refers to a very practical awareness of God in every situation of life. You're becoming a more God-centered, God-thinking, God-aware person in your life. Number six and seven are similar, but there's some nuances that are different. The Number six, brotherly kindness. It's the Greek word Philadelphia, which means brotherly love. It is the feeling of kindness or mutual understanding and care that should exist among family members, brotherly. We know that the writers of the New Testament often didn't mean your, your literal blood brother, but your blood-bought brother, your Christian brother, your Christian sister. Green says it's that feeling of kindness or mutual understanding and care that should exist among your family. And then lastly, we have love, which is the Greek word agape. And this is a self-sacrificing commitment to seek that person's highest good. As God has done for us. 
a good word for us right now. Sometimes we, we're witnessing to someone, we're parenting, we're counseling, and, and the person that we're trying to, to love and serve will say something like this. Well, if you loved me, you would let me do this. You would not critique me. This makes me happy. So why are you meddling in my affairs? And agape love seeks the highest good for that person, just as God in Christ did for us. And so we must push past the emotion. We must push past the, the impulse, and we must push toward giving them Christ, giving them the word of God. That is the truest form of love. Those are the seven. They're based upon faith in Christ. That's the foundation. If you're here today and you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ to rest in what he did on the cross when he said to the Father in John 19, 30, it is finished. Tetelestai, paid in full. If you've never put your faith, hope, and trust in Christ alone, you're resting in him, then God's word to you is not, you need to go out and get your affairs in order. And you need to live out these seven things. My dad, I've shared this with you before. He's in heaven now, so he got it right. But he was not a Christian man when, when I was younger. And his, quote, gospel, you, you got to see, I'm doing the Richard Nixon air quotes, gospel. His gospel to me and my brother, Brian and Stephen and my sister, Christy, is he would just look at us eyeball to eyeball and say, straighten up and fly right. That's all he had in his toolbox. That's not the gospel. The gospel is the good news of what God in Christ did for you through his life, death, burial, and resurrection. It's done. It's paid in full. You don't add one thing to it. So if you've never received that by faith, received Christ by faith, then these other seven things, that's not what you need to be concerned about today. That would, if you went out and, and started trying to check, 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 check those seven things without prior personal faith in Jesus Christ, that would be like rearranging the furniture on the Titanic. The ship's going down. It doesn't matter if the portrait on the wall is straight or not. So I hope and pray that that's the first thing you will tend to. But now I'm talking to many who have already experienced that grace and power of God in the gospel of Jesus. And he's saying, that's a foundation of gold. Don't you dare build a tin shack on top of that. In proportion to the greatness of Christ and the greatness of your salvation, go out and live that way. Build upon that by your faith in Christ. I know most of you pretty well, and I know what exposure you've had to this word election, which is used in verse 10. I don't know some of you, and I don't know what, where your background comes from with that word, that concept. It's a biblical word. I didn't make it up. It's right here in the text. Listen to what John Piper says about this verse. The danger described in verses 8 and 9, we just looked at those. You might want to glance back up, right? You'll be useless. You'll be unfruitful. Uh, you will forget your former sins being washed away. You become blind. The danger, he says, is not the danger of slipping into the kingdom with no reward. It's the danger of not being saved at all. When Peter says, be zealous to confirm your call and election, he means that a lack of zeal 
might mean, please, please hear that, might mean that you were never called and are not among the elect. And then I love this little slogan. He, it's almost like a slogan. He says, the confirmation of your election is your progress in sanctification. The confirmation of your election is your progress in sanctification. Romans chapter 8 verse 29 says, He predestined you to be conformed to the likeness of Christ. And those whom he predestined, he called. And those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. So this, uh, this predestining was to make us more like Jesus. That's straight out of Romans 8, 29. Therefore, the reassuring evidence that we have been predestined is a progressive conformity to Christ's likeness. Do you see that? I'm not... I'm not making this up. I'm not, this isn't my hobby horse. So again, I, I just hearken back. Have you heard the gospel? Well, you've heard it today if you've never heard it before. Have you responded to that call of repentance towards God and faith in Jesus Christ? How do you know if that Repentance and faith is genuine, you might ask. Has he changed your heart to lean upon Christ and to live for Christ? Not perfection, but direction. You see, the danger with the one camp is they would say, you can have no assurance of salvation because you could always be improving on these seven things. It's like the Norman Rockefeller uh, question, how much money is enough money? He said, just a little bit more. That's the danger on that side. But the danger on this side is to say, he chose me before the foundation of the world. The work is finished. I'm just going to eat, drink, and be merry and put my hands behind my head and my feet propped up on the coffee table and just coast straight into heaven. And here Peter gives us this sweet spot in the middle. I hope it's coming to you, coming across as a sweet spot. Not boasting, but beholding. Not coasting, but climbing. Not earning, but belonging. It's not only here in Second Peter that this tension arises. I picked a handful of bullets to put in the gun and fire across the bow this morning. Listen to... One, two, three, four, five verses. Listen to these. And just to show you that this is not Peter's hobby horse either, as though he said something different than the rest of the pack. But I want you to notice how this work hard for Jesus is tethered to and undergirded by the grace of God in Christ, lest we turn this into a bootstrap religion. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence only, but also in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. One chapter later, Philippians 3, 14. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, he's just spent... 11, 13 verses before that telling how he was taken hold of by Christ. And now he's saying, I press on to know him more. 1 Corinthians 15, 10, By the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain. But I labored more than all of the rest, 
yet not I, but the grace of God within me. Colossians 1.29, for this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Oh, don't you love the, the flow of that? I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Hebrews 12.1, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And lastly, 1 Timothy 6, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Store up for yourself the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life and life indeed. So Peter's not just out there, as we would say. He's teaching and preaching in harmony with the rest of Scripture. So what has God said to you today? My prayer when I was in the back singing our final song before I was coming up was, God, if there's someone here who's unbiblically comfortable, coasting, would you shake them up a little bit? And, and drive them back to the foot of the cross. If there's someone here who's a very tender conscience and they just constantly doubt their salvation for unbiblical reasons, maybe it's just a perfectionism in their mind. Maybe they were raised in a certain way that just makes them doubt. But God, they're the real deal but they just tend to hear a sermon like this and be ripped to ribbons. If that's them, God, let this come across with comfort and, and a biblical assurance. The main homework assignment, if you will, is to grow in your knowledge of Christ. That, that's, that's what he's been saying for now 11 verses. A growing Christian is a knowing Christian, and a knowing Christian is a growing Christian. These seven uh, traits are almost unnecessary, almost They are necessary, but they're the byproduct of knowing Christ. So, get out of fuzzy land in your sanctification. Uh, I've heard John use that word. I don't know where you got it from, but uh, in counseling, I'll hear him sometimes say, no, no, sanctification doesn't happen in fuzzy land. And what I mean by that is where you might hear a sermon like this and say, well, I know I need to be more like Jesus. May it happen. Amen. And you, and you just move along, right? It, that, does that sound like, verse 5, apply all diligence? That doesn't sound like applying all diligence. That sounds like fuzzy land. So maybe there is a, you want to hone in on one of these seven and say, oh, I'm, I'm really deficient in this. And out of faith in Christ, I want to grow in this area. And I want to apply all diligence in growing in this area. Not fuzzy land prayer. God, I have impure thoughts sometimes. Would you take those away? Oh, yeah, pray that. Absolutely pray that. But then uh, have you put some protection on your phone and your Internet so that if you go to a certain site, 
your accountability partner is alerted that you went to a site today that is pornographic. You see the difference between, God, take my impure thoughts away, and now I'm praying that, but I'm putting some teeth to that commitment in that prayer. God, I want to know, I want to know you better. I want to know scripture better. Would you make that happen? Okay, pray that, but now, like, carve out five verses to memorize. Get an accountability partner that will help you and hold you accountable. Enter into a discipleship relationship. It's going to take some time. It's going to cost you. But that's applying all diligence. God, I, I'm not a very kind, brotherly, kind, loving person. I see some of these people in our church, and they just ooze with hospitality. I don't have that gift. Could you make that happen? Okay, pray that, but then open up your home. You know, hey, I want to invite two families to come over. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cook for them. I can cook spaghetti. That's it. Just ask my wife. That's about where the list ends. I'm going to make some spaghetti. We're going to eat. And as I'm doing this and I'm praying, I become a more loving person. I love the illustration John Wesley had years ago when he, now pounds was the form of currency over there, so don't, don't miss this. But one of his church members' houses burned to the ground, and they all, half the church rode up on horseback and just stared there and wept as the fire continued to burn. And this person said, and this person said, and this person said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And Wesley pulled his hat off and he said, I'm sorry, 100 pounds. And he put 100 pounds worth of currency in his hat. And he passed it to the guy on the left-hand side and said, how much are you sorry, Brother Bill? It's easy just to say words, but when we put action to them, that helps us to grow in true Christ-like character. Next week, I'm going to use this last phrase as a launching pad into verses 12 through 15. But I just want to leave you with this. The main culprit, as I've seen it in these verses, is a forgetfulness of Christ and his amazing grace forgiving us of sins reconciling us. So where, where am I getting this? I'm getting it in verse 9. I think that's the main culprit. So if you want to just keep like digging down to the bottom, to the bottom, to the bottom, you hit there, you've hit rock bottom in my opinion. I said earlier, was it a cause or effect? I think it could be both, but I'm using it here as the cause. And so we need to develop strategies where we do not let the light of the gospel of the glory of God in the face of Christ grow dim in our hearts. Or to put it differently, we need to preach the gospel to ourselves every day. We need to preach the gospel to ourselves. We need to pray the gospel. We need to sing the gospel. We need to share the gospel. And I mean with unbelievers, yes, but I mean with believers. Just Get a cup of coffee, get a glass of tea, and say, let me tell you what Jesus has done for my hell-deserving soul. Let me tell you, I can't get over being forgiven. I can't get over that I'm a son of God through the blood of Christ. Without the blood of Christ, I couldn't even approach God in prayer, but because of his shed blood, I can call him Abba Father. We need to do that regularly. And I think as we do that, that's going to keep the main things, the main things. It's going to give us strategy in sanctification that's not in fuzzy land, but it's going to promote our sanctification from the foundation of faith in Christ, not legalism, moralism, performance Christianity. If I do this, he will love me. If I don't do it, he won't love me. It keeps us out of that ditch. I'm going to send you, I'll get, I'm, I'm not smart enough, I have to ask Byron to send stuff on our 
uh, webpage. But I'm going to get him to send that, put that on our webpage and send out an email. There's a book that I have read. You've heard me quote it. Uh, C.J. Mahaney, Living the Cross-Centered Life. And that book has helped me to stay gospel-centered uh, more than any other uh, book has. So I, I'll be getting you some excerpts this week, and then I will come back to that a little bit in next week's sermon. Let's pray together. Oh God, there's so much that we've just jumped into and we've swum around a little. We can't touch the bottom of this body of water. It's too deep for us. I pray that it has refreshed the weary soul. I pray that it has hydrated the thirsty one. And I pray that it has humbled the one who has come in merely holding on to their profession, but not looking into the nitty gritty, the, the tall weeds, as we might say, of what that looks like lived out. God, to you, to your son, to the Holy Spirit, be all credit honor, and glory. Let us be gospel-saturated people and let us share that with others. In Jesus' name.